Oh yeah, then it's normal. It's under the track here. Yes. Okay, so let's begin with the questions. We have three questions uh, in English and one question in Chinese. The first question in English is about subtle impermanence. How do we meditate on subtle impermanence? Because we mentioned impermanence, there is gross impermanence and subtle impermanence. So, how do we meditate on subtle impermanence? And also, the second part of the question is whether subtle impermanence is further subdiv subdivided, whether it has any internal divisions, like you know, the subtle of the subtle or the gross of the subtle, and things like that. Okay. So, first of all, how do we meditate? on subtle impermanence. So when we meditate on subtle impermanence, basically we have to look at this feature that all functioning entities, all impermanent phenomena disintegrate momentarily. So we're looking at this momentary transformation, which is a momentary disintegration. Now, when uh, an, uh, an object, a functioning object, impermanent entity is established, from the first moment that it is established, we have to take into account this momentary disintegration. Actually, it could not have been established if the previous moment, which actually was the moment of, let's say, the causes or the resources that made it up. So if that previous moment did not, did not disintegrate, we would not have the establishment or the production of the first moment of that new entity. And then from the first moment that this new entity is established, momentarily it disintegrates, momentarily it changes. So it is within its own nature to change momentarily. It is not within its nature to remain, to abide without changing. So first of all, we have to perform this type of analytical meditation and you can do it with a specific object. Let's say you take a vase or whatever, whatever object you want to take as, a, as an example. And you say from the first moment that this vase was established, it was established in the nature. It has this nature of disintegration. It cannot remain. It just changes all the time. So we perform this analytical meditation. Basically, we have to understand that these type of phenomena that are produced by the combination of causes, they do not need to rely on some external force in order to disintegrate, in order to be destroyed. They have this internal condition within them because the cause from which they are created are impermanent and they Therefore, when you combine these type of causes, the nature of the product that you create is that it will change momentarily. It cannot remain static. So start by doing this analytical meditation with one specific object and go through this logic. And once you find certainty on that, then you can um, engage placement meditation. So just reach the point of certainty that says that all functioning entities, all impermanent phenomena are, have the nature of momentary disintegration. So this is subtle impermanence. And just then stay with that and understand that it applies to this whole class of phenomena. So uh, this is how we do it. First of all, we have to do analytical meditation. We find this certainty and then we do placement meditation. So we always combine the analytical with the placement. So this is for the first part of the question. The second part of the question, actually, uh, you know, different scholars have different positions. So there are some scholars who say that, yes, you can, you can have internal divisions so within subtle impermanence so you can have subtle impermanence that then becomes even more subtle and more subtle and you can differentiate different levels of subtlety within subtle impermanence however the majority of scholars do not make this distinction they do not make this differentiation so they just talk about impermanence they say okay we have gross impermanence and we have subtle impermanence but they do not further sub divide subtle impermanence um, but then they say you know once you reach the first ground you can have a more subtle understanding of subtle impermanence but it's not that we're having subdivisions uh, of impermanence 
Awesome. Okay, the second question was a question about the beings who are born in the first hell, the hell of continual resurrection. So we had a discussion about the hot hells, the cold hells. Uh, we looked at the suffering of the hungry ghosts, the animals, and so forth. And when we described the existence of the beings in the hell of continual resurrection, we said that as soon as the beings are born there, they... Um, they come about and they look at each other, at other beings in those hells, and immediately they perceive them as animals, enemies, they generate very strong anger, and their hands are armed with knives and different types of weapons instantly. And then they, they jump on each other, they attack each other, and they hack each other to pieces. So the question was that, you know, those beings who are in those hells for a very long time, whilst they're there, they create quite a lot of negative karma. And is there anything we can do from our side to help them? Actually, the answer to that is that we cannot directly help them. For as long as those beings have to remain in this type of existence, the existence of the hell, and similarly the hungry ghosts and so forth, for as long as their karma um, prescribes that they have to remain there, for as long as this hell karma it remains, is not exhausted, they have to remain there and they have to experience that suffering. So from our own side, directly, we cannot help them. We cannot reduce their suffering. We cannot intervene in their situation. Uh, there is something that we can do. As we say, we meditate and we focus and contemplate on their suffering. And as we do this, you know, there's virtue that we create because we generate the wish and say, may those beings be free from their suffering. We can dedicate that root of virtue that we create so that in the future, when their karma is exhausted, they can benefit from that root of virtue that we have dedicated towards them. That's the only way we can help. Okay, we come now to the third question. There is a question with many sub-questions in it. It contains quite a lot. So it really has to do about uh, the bardo and the time of death. So basically, what is the bardo? How do we establish it? What happens in the bardo? That is uh, kind of like the first uh, cluster of questions about the bardo. The second question is, uh, I have uh, like someone that I know who is, does not have much time to live, they have about six months, and how can I help them reduce their attachment and their craving? Um, following from that, you know, in general, how we can help people who are uh, towards the end of their life, what type of practices, how we can help them. And finally, you know, there is that idea that uh, the thoughts that occur to our minds uh, just at the time of death appear to be, they said that they're very crucial. So is it true that they're very important and they determine our next rebirth? Okay, so let's begin with the first one, all about bardo. Okay, when we talk about uh, beings, we talk about beings of the six types of migrations. And the bardo beings actually are not classified as any of those six types of migrations. But those six types of migrations are actually subsumed or they come under the four types of existence. So when we talk about the four types of existence, we talk about the birth existence, the death existence, the bardo existence, and the previous existence. So we want to look at this bardo. What is this bardo? Basically, the bardo is the intermediate state between death and your next life. So we live this life, we come to the end, we go through the experience of death. Before we are reborn in our next life, there is a period in between. It's like a break between the death of the previous life and the rebirth of the next life. And that in-between state is bardo. Actually, bardo is a Tibetan word that just means in between. So everyone who dies will have to go through the bardo in order to be reborn. 
everyone except for those who are born in the formless realm. If you are taking rebirth in the formless realm, you will not have to go through the bardo, the break or the experience of the bardo. Okay, so let's say that you go, you are a human, you die, and you're going to be reborn again as a human. So because you will be reborn again as a human, you establish a bardo of a human. So when we describe the bardo, the bardo of a human, it means that in your next life, you're coming as a human being. That bardo being has a number of characteristics. The first one is that their sense faculties are complete. The second one is that they have bodies that are unimpeded. It means that, let's say, the walls or a mountain or any other material object cannot stop you. If the bardo being wants to travel, they just go straight through those things. The third characteristic is that they, wherever they want to go, they think of a particular place and they arrive there instantly, immediately, right? So they just have to think about it and they have already arrived there. And the next feature is that bardo beings can see other bardo beings of that class, but they cannot see other bardo beings of other class. So let's say if you are a bardo, bardo being of a human, meaning in your next life you'll be a human, that bardo, that human bardo being can see other human bardo beings, but it cannot see bardo hell beings, right? But bardo hell beings, they can see each other. All right. So they, you can see other bardo beings who belong in the same type of class. And the reason for that is because they have some sort of um, visual higher power, like clairvoyance of the eyes, of the eye power. That's why they can see other bardo beings of the same class. Okay, so um, oh, in terms of uh, what they eat, uh, the only thing that they can consume is smells in the bardo. And this is why an alternative name for bardo beings is smell eaters. Okay, so all this is about, about the bardo beings. Now, what is the experience? What is it like to be in the bardo? So the moment you arrive in the bardo, the moment you are born in the bardo existence, you are confronted with those hallucinations like they are mistaken appearances you're hallucinating and what you're seeing is quite frightening so this is the experience of the bardo being okay we move into the next part how can we actually help someone who doesn't have much time left to reduce their craving and their attachment okay so Hopefully, the person you're talking about um, is someone who is um, a Buddhist or has interest in Buddhism. So basically, you need to talk to them in a way that you can help them understand the faults, the shortcomings of craving, of attachment. And... It will be very good if you encourage this person to consider the law of cause and effect, to consider refuge, to think about past and future lives. And by doing all this, just introduce all the faults of attachment, the faults of uh, craving. And at this time, at the end of the one's life, it is very good to encourage people to let go of possessions. So the things that they are attached to, you must encourage them to give them away. So tell them, you know, make a donation or practice generosity or give your things away. It will be so much better. So again, always reinforce the positive of giving away and the negativity of keeping on, you know, clinging into these objects. And Geshe was saying, even if you have to uh, resort to methods such as stealing the possessions of this person, just to tell them that, you know, if you think that it's going to benefit them, if you deprive them if you, of these objects, if you remove these objects from their possession, because this is the best thing you can be doing to actually help them 
overcome and reduce their attachment and their craving at that time. Okay, in general now, in terms of helping someone who is towards the end of their lives, um, I would say again, you know, if the person is Buddhist, it's very good to encourage them to think about refuge, to consider about, um, you know, bodhicitta, um, or to recite mantras, different mantras, and so forth, because you want to help them to place more positive imprints in their minds. So if the situation allows it in the sense that the person is a Buddhist or is you know, open to Buddhism, then it will be very good to do that. Okay, the last thing about the thoughts at the end of our life or at the end of our death. Yes, it is true, they're very important. They can determine very much what we'll be doing in the type of rebirth we will be taking. In terms of karma, we have accumulate, been accumulating karma since beginningless time. So we have quite a lot of karma stored in our minds. And at the end of our lives, um, this something will activate some of this karma. So according to the presentation of the 12 links, so what activates this karma is craving and taking. So if, let's say, you're going to be reborn in the hot hell, at the end of your life, you will feel very cold. And because you're very cold, you will start craving for heat. So there is this craving for heat, and this will activate your previous karma to be reborn in the hot hell. So because of that issue, we say that it is very good to reinforce virtuous thoughts towards the end of our lives so that we can have a good rebirth. So thinking about faith, thinking about bodhicitta. If you pass away with thoughts of hatred and attachment, this is going to lead you to a bad river. Yes. Okay, uh, so we come to the next question. A question about observing how one passes away, the amount of suffering that is involved in that, and whether that can be an indication of the type of rebirth that the person will take. So, for example, we said that someone is reborn as a hungry ghost because at the time of death, they almost cannot bear to, to look at food. They don't want to eat anything. They cannot bear to eat at food. And with that thought, they pass away that I don't want to see food again and then they're born as a hungry ghost. So, you know, sometimes when we observe cancer patients and uh, they, like, they don't want to eat or they, they go through different, you know, it's not an easy death. So if we look at the way that they pass away, is this a sign, is this an indication that perhaps they're taking a rebirth as a hell being or as a hungry ghost? Okay, so that's the question. And Geshe is saying in the answer, the answer to that is that in general, yes, you can look at the type of death. And if the death is difficult and the, if there is this type of suffering involved, uh, this is a general indication that it's not going to be a good rebirth. So we explained, for example, that if you have a person that at the time of the death, they feel very cold, the craving that they will have is craving for heat. And such a person activates uh, the karma to be reborn in the hot hell. Or if you have someone who is feeling very hot at the time of their death, they're going to be craving cold. And as a result of that, you have someone, uh, the person taking rebirth in the cold health. Or if you have uh, um, someone who does not want to eat anything, does not want to even look at food, that can be an indication indeed that the person will be reborn as a hell being. Okay, so in general, these are the indications. They are not indications of, um, you know, good a good rebirth. It's not a good, um, it's not a good death. And many times we observe people pass away with incredible pain, incredible suffering. So it's a painful death. And most, uh, in most cases, this is an indication of rebirth in the hells. 
Okay, having said this, nothing is written in stone because even though you might have established the bardo of a hell being, if someone with whom you have a really close connection, all right, so someone, let's say, who has benefited from your generosity or someone in your family or someone with whom you have a dharma connection and so on and so forth, if that person with whom, uh, who has a connect, strong connection with you, practices a strong virtue and dedicates that virtue for your benefit, it can actually have an effect. And even though you have already established the bardo of the hell being, it can immediately after that, you can establish the bardo of a human and then be reborn as a human or the bardo for a good rebirth. And you can take rebirth, a good rebirth. Okay, so there is no hard, fast rule. We say in general, it's not a good indication if you don't have a good death, but it can change in the bardo if practices are done for you. Okay, so let's go into our text now. We finished with the questions. So we are at the part of where we're doing the actual practice. The actual, we say meditation has the actual practice and the um, period in between sessions. So for the actual session, we have four subjects. When we are training the mind in the path that is shared with the individual of the small scope, the first one is reflecting on impermanence, so the uncertainty of death. The second one is reflecting on the unfortunate rebirth suffering. And the third one is going for refuge to the three jewels. And then we have the fourth subject. So we're about to start with the third one, which is going for refuge. If you look on page 13, halfway down, um, it's, uh, it says here, as for the third outline, training in going for refuge. From the holy body of the Guru Yidam, residing on the top of your head, are emanated assemblies of Gurus, Yidams, three jewels, Dakas, Dakinis, Dharma protectors, which fill the space. Visualize clearly the refuge being surrounding the Guru Yidam residing on the top of your head. Okay, so you say that we, we have this visualization where we have the root guru at uh, the crown of our head. So now we visualize that rays of light emanate from his body. And at the tips of those rays of light, basically we establish the field of accumulation. So we establish the whole visualization again because we want to go for refuge. So you see here that we emanate the gurus, the yidans, the three jewels, dakas, dakinis, dharma protectors. So we establish this visualization um, above our head. And once we visualize clearly, he says, while recollecting the qualities of their bodies, holy bodies, speech, minds, and enlightened activities, go for refuge to the guru yidam, three jewels with the aspiration thinking. So you visualize them and you reflect on the qualities of their body, speech, mind, enlightened activities, and then you go for refuge by thinking the following. From now on, please protect all sentient beings, the mothers, as well as myself, from the general samsaric suffering, and in particular from the three types of unfortunate rebirth suffering. Okay, so we actually have to recite, then we do the visualization with the descent of nectar and so forth, and we recite the formula for going for refuge hundreds and thousands of times. Okay, so as you can see here in the easy path, we have a very short presentation of refuge. However, the refuge is a very important subject to discuss. As beginners, this is the main practice we should be doing. We should be focusing on refuge. Now, Master Atisha, when he was in Tibet, he kept teaching on two subjects again and again. He taught a lot of refuge and he taught a lot on karma to the point that he, they changed his name and they were referring to him as the refuge lama and the karma lama because he was basically, he was just teaching these two subjects. So refuge actually is extremely important for us and you can see that the, base, the two 
practices for beginners uh, really is refuge and an understanding of karma. And for that reason, Gesho has decided to elaborate a little bit on the presentation of this important practice. So we will present karma in five outlines. The first one is the cause, the reason why we go for, car for refuge. The second one is the objects to which we go for refuge. The third one, understanding the reason and the objects of refuge is the third one is the way that we go for refuge then after that we have the benefits of going for refuge and finally we have the training or the advice after going for refuge okay so first of all we are looking at the cause for going for refuge and we have to identify that we have refuge of uh, at different levels. So we have to talk about the refuge of the individual of the small scope, the refuge of the individual of the middle scope, the refuge of the individual of the great scope, and each one of them has slightly different causes. Basically, the main causes are fear and faith. So let's look at them at each level. For the individual of the small scope, there is the fear of suffering in relation to the lower migrations. And secondly, we have the faith of conviction that the three jewels, the objects of refuge, have the power to protect us from the karma that we have created that might throw us in this type of suffering. Then for the individual of the middle scope, there is fear for the suffering of samsara. And there is the faith of conviction that the three jewels have the power to protect us from the karma that we have created to have these experiences in samsara. Finally, for the individual of the great scope, there is fear, not just for oneself, but for all other sentient beings. So fear for myself and others, having to experience all types of suffering associated with samsara and nirvana. And then on top of that, having the faith of conviction that the objects of refuge have the power to protect us from this type, of, from the karma that would result in this type of experiences. So as you can see, the main causes are fear and faith, but the fear is different, but it, they are differentiated according to the three levels of the individual. So just last week, we spent a bit of time talking about the suffering of the lower migrations. We talked about the suffering of the health, the hungry ghosts and the animals. However, we didn't go into any huge detail. We just uh, briefly mentioned the different types of hell. We didn't even fully enumerate them. However, if you do an extensive presentation, there are 36 types of hells. So you could spend a lot of time contemplating the suffering associated with the hells. And then, of course, we have the suffering of the hungry ghosts, the suffering of the animals, and so forth. So all this presentation that we had last week basically establishes this first type, the first of the two causes uh, for going for refuge for the individual of the small scope. The important thing to consider here is that sometimes we think that the hells are very far away. However, they're not. The only thing that separates us from the suffering of the lower migrations is the fact that we are breathing. And if this is our last breath, we inhale and then we exhale. If there is no more inhalation, it means that actually we are there. We are going to reach there very quickly. And there is suffering associated with that. Once we arrive in this type of rebirth, in this type of existence, there is tremendous amount of suffering. So we consider that and we think that we go for refuge with the understanding of the protection that we can receive. Okay, so we stress here that we need to meditate on the suffering of the lower migrations, right? But when we do this meditation, if we actually treat the subject 
as a, more or less like a movie or that something that happens to somebody else. You know, there are some other beings who fall in the hell, some other beings that are born as hungry ghosts and they suffer such and such suffering. If you think about it in this way, if you meditate about it in this way, it will not really affect you. For this meditation to be effective, you have to go through this, uh, um, you know, visualization or experience of saying, I am reborn in the hell. I am experiencing this and this suffering. And then go through all those experiences of suffering as if it is you who is undergoing this suffering. So it has to be a personal experience in your meditation. You might be thinking, "I why am I doing this? Like I have a human rebirth. I'm not born there why do i have to meditate like this but consider this example consider the example let's say of a goat or a sheep or an animal that is driven to the slaughterhouse this animal with every step is just getting closer to their death it's just that they're not aware of it yet right so our situation is the same right now we are, we have this human existence but we are constantly marching towards death we are coming very close to this situation where our life force will be separated it will be severed from the body and what happens after that is that we actually are at the moment we are carrying this incredible amount of negativities we have created all these negativities and obscurations since beginningless time but even in this life we created even more negativity and obscurations so we're carrying all this negativity with us and when the time comes where the the mind or consciousness and the body are separated then we will have to deal with the consequences of having all this negativity. So we have to consider that if we do go for refuge properly, the objects of refuge have the power to protect us and we, would do, we will not need to undergo these experiences. We will not need to experience all this suffering. Otherwise, if we don't do it like this, if we don't personally participate, think that we are participating, experiencing this suffering, we will not really generate any genuine fear and the cause for our refuge will not be solid. So then the result of refuge will not be solid. So fear is one of the components, one of the causes. The other cause is to have really um, faith that the objects of refuge have the power to protect us. And in order to establish this, we need to fully understand their qualities. If we can understand the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the qualities of body, speech and mind, light and activities and so forth, then we would be convinced that they have the power to protect us. And therefore, Geshe is saying, uh, you know, those of you who have the time to study more extensively, you can look at the extensive Lamrim or the Prasna Paramita text where they talk about the qualities of the objects of refuge. So we have established uh, the first one, which is the reasons for going for refuge, which we say it is uh, fear and conviction in their power to protect. The second is the objects of refuge. So to whom we go for refuge? Now, we know that we go for refuge to the three jewels. And previously, when we established the visualization of the field of marriage or the field of accumulation. We established all those objects. So we had this visualization of the five groups of gurus and then around them we had all the yidams and the Buddhas. So they represent the Buddha jewel. And then we had bodhisattvas, hearers, solitary realizers, Dakas, Dakinis, and protectors. They represent the Sangha jewel. And in front of each one of those figures, we had a little table, and on the table we had a text, and that text actually represents the Dharma that each one of them specifies or individually teaches. So it uh, also represents the qualities of realizations and cessations within their own mind stream. So it is very good to understand 
what we posit as the Buddha, what we posit as the Dharma, what we posit as the Sangha, as these are the main objects for our refuge. So let's identify now the three objects of refuge. We have, first of all, the Buddha jewel. So the Buddha jewel is the being who has perfected the two purposes. The two purposes are one's own purpose and the purpose of others. So the Buddha jewel is actually pre, uh, presented as the two types of body, which is the Dharma body and the form body. The Dharma body is for the sake, for one's own purpose, and the form body is for the purpose of others. In terms of the Dharma body, we identify two uh, bodies again within that. We identify the perfect, the body of perfect abandonment and the body of perfect realization. In terms of the form body, we have a twofold division, which is the enjoyment body and the emanation body. So this is how we present the Buddha jewel. So the perfection of the two purposes. Then we move into the next one, which is the Dharma jewel. The Dharma jewel is um, the truth of cessation or the truth of the path uh, included within the continuum of an Arya being. Okay, so when we talk about the truth of cessation and the truth of the path, this is the ultimate Dharma jewel. This is the actual Dharma jewel. And we say that it must exist within the continuum of an Arya being, a being who has realization of emptiness. Um, and apart from the ultimate Dharma jewel, we also have the imputed Dharma jewel because we have the texts, the various classifications and divisions of texts that actually teach the truth of uh, cessation and the truth of path. So they have the truth of cessation and truth path as their own subject matter. So all those texts are the imputed Dharma jewel. Then we come to the Sangha jewel. With the Sangha jewel, we uh, have, uh, we defined it as the qualities of uh, knowledge and uh, practice existing within the continuum of an area being. So the area being here is someone who has a direct realization of emptiness. If we look at the progression along the five paths, we have beings going into the progressing along the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, and then they enter the path of seeing. So only after one has the direct realization of emptiness and has entered the path of seeing, only then one is classified as an area being. So the ultimate Sangha is qualities of knowledge and practice within the continuum of an area being. Again, we have the imputed Sangha jewel, which can be, uh, is the assembly of four, minimum of four uh, ordained beings, such as uh, Gelong or Getsu and so forth. So you see for the Dharma jewel and the Sangha jewel, we have the ultimate and the imputed. Okay, so we gave this presentation, but we can actually explain it a little bit more to clarify it and become easier to understand. So here we are, we are like ordinary beings, we have not even entered the path yet. Um, however, we begin meditating on bodhicitta and emptiness, we are introduced in those subjects. So as we meditate on those things, there comes a point where we actually generate bodhicitta and we generate some understanding of emptiness. At the point where we generate bodhicitta, we enter the great vehicle path of accumulation. Okay, so we say we have some understanding of emptiness and we continue meditating on emptiness, becoming more and more familiar with that. So when we develop the special insight focusing on emptiness, we progress from the path of accumulation to the path of preparation. Having reached the path of preparation again, we don't stop there, but we continue to meditate more and more on emptiness. Always this meditation on emptiness is influenced by the aspect of our bodhicitta. So there comes a point that we actually develop the special insight that has a direct realization on emptiness. So when we have that direct realization on emptiness, we enter the path of seeing. 
So as we enter the path of seeing, we become an Arya being, and our own mind becomes the truth of the path. So remember that thing that we say that the actual Dharma is the truth of the path and the truth of cessation? So when we have that direct realization of emptiness, our mind becomes the truth of the path, and we become the Dharma jewel. Okay, so when we uh, have the direct realization of emptiness, we're on the path of seeing. First of all, we obtain what is called the uninterrupted path of seeing. In the uninterrupted path of seeing, we abandon seeing abandonments together with their seeds. And because we abandon those things, the next thing that we obtain is the liberated path of seeing. So both the uninterrupted and the liberated path of seeing are defined, they are both paths of seeing, so they are both defined as the Dharma jewel. Okay, when we reach the liberated path of seeing, we say that we have actually abandoned, meaning we have removed those seeing abandonments and their seeds. So at that point, we have obtained a cessation. So we have obtained the truth of cessation. So this is how we obtain the truth of cessation. Remember the presentation in the Four Noble Truths. So first of all, we say that we have origin and suffering, right? So that tells you that you have a cause that brings about a result. And then we say that we have cessation and we have the path. So in that sense, you can say that the path is the cause that will bring about the cessation. So the true path will bring about the truth cessation. And this is why the uninterrupted path, the path of seeing, has to happen first before we establish the truth of cessation. Okay, so we have obtained the path of seeing, uninterrupted path, liberated path. Then we continue to meditate on emptiness, more and more refining, having more and more familiarity, and we obtain the path of meditation. We come to the, again, at the very end of the path of meditation, we will have a liberated path and we obtain another level of abandonment and cessation there. And from there, we will move into the path of normal learning and establish the four bodies of Buddha, obtaining the resultant state of Buddhahood. Okay, so we mentioned refuge and we said that the causes of refuge are fear and faith. And the question here is if you need all three objects of refuge every time you want to be protected from a particular fear. So if we're just talking about one individual fear, one individual difficult situation, actually you do not need to take refuge in all three objects. And we have some examples uh, here. There was uh, um, the, you know, particular the person that was uh, experiencing the fear of being trampled by animals, by horses and animals and so forth. And she took refuge to Chinrezig and immediately he was uh, protected from that. There was another case of an individual. His name was Campo, and he attained the state of an Arhat, and he had a relative. So the relative of this Arhat went um, out into the sea together with other merchants on a boat looking for uh, jewels, as usually is the case. And in the middle of the ocean, the weather was very bad and there was great danger of the boat capsizing. So the relative of this Arhat, he just uh, made a prayer and took refuge in his relative, the Arhat Campo, and that actually had the power to pacify the waves and the boat and all the people traveling were saved. Um, another example that we have was that uh, the king of the Nagas actually took aim at uh, Mongaliana and he was uh, 
um, shooting weapons at him. However, he took up um, refuge and he turned all those weapons into flowers. So these are some cases that indicate that if you just need to be protected from one fear, one dangerous situation, you don't need to take um, refuge in all three objects of refuge. However, in our case, we are discussing here this fear of death that we have, which is the fear about all the types of suffering in samsara and all the types of suffering in the lower migrations. So if you want to be protected from all this, you need to take refuge in the three jewels. It is similar to the case of someone who is critically ill. When you have someone who is very ill, they're going to need a very skillful doctor, but the doctor is not enough. They also need the right medicine, and also they will need the support of a nurse. So we are in a situation like this. We need someone who will teach us the path. So this is why we have the Buddha jewel. It's like our guide, our teacher. Um, also, we are going to need the truth of cessation and the truth of the path, because as we say, these things are the real antidotes. The real thing that protects us is the Dharma jewel. And finally, we will need Dharma companions, right? Other people who support us in our practice. So we will need the Sangha jewel. So this is why we say that if you want to be protected, um, at the time, you know, from this fear that we have at the time of death. If you want to be protected from all samsaric suffering and all the suffering of the lower migrations, you will need to take refuge in all three objects, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Okay, so we say that we go for refuge to these uh, three objects, the three jewels, but uh, it is important that we establish that they are worthy objects of refuge. So in terms of the Buddha jewel, we say that the Buddha is a worthy object of refuge because of four reasons. And basically, if you are going for refuge to someone, this uh, being must have these four qualities. These four reasons are four qualities. So the first one is that the Buddha himself has reached the state of fearlessness. It means that he is completely free from the fear of the suffering of samsara or any other type of suffering of lower migrations and so forth. So himself is free of fear. The second quality is that he is very skilled in teaching others how to avoid the fear of their own suffering from the lower migrations and samsara and so forth. The third reason is that he is completely filled with compassion without any partiality. And the fourth reason is that he always works for the benefit of others without discriminating between those who have benefited him or those who have harmed him. So if you're going to go for refuge for someone, you should look for someone who has all of those four qualities. So for the first one, that himself has reached the state of fearlessness, if you look, for example, at uh, the deities that non-Buddhists believe in, so Intra, Brahma, Ishvara, and so forth, they themselves are not free from cyclic existence. They are not free from the fear of cyclic existence. And if they're not free themselves, so why would you take refuge in them? right? It is similar to the case of someone who doesn't know how to swim and has fallen into a river. Now, if someone is going to save that person, it has to be someone who knows how to swim and knows how to swim well. Because if a second person jumps into the water to save the first person, if the second person doesn't know how to swim either, they are both going to drown. If the second person is a good swimmer, they can pull out the first person out of the currents of the water. So it is like this. Um, the Buddha is completely free, is fearless uh, about all the suffering in cyclic existence and so forth. Okay, the second uh, quality, the second characteristic, as we say, is that he's very skilled in explaining, telling others how to avoid this suffering. 
And uh, here the example, the that point is that if you don't have someone who is skilled, is skilled in explaining, telling you how to do it, even though they might be capable of doing it themselves, they will not understand it. So they say it's like the child of uh, a mother who is not taking the time to teach them how to read or they don't, doesn't know how to teach them how to read. So the, the child remains illiterate. Mm -hmm. So we come now to the third quality of the Buddha that establishes that the Buddha is a suitable object of refuge. So the third quality is that he has um, compassion that uh, equally pervades everyone. So he does not have partiality. So the Buddha does not differentiate between friends and enemy, taking sides, uh, favoring some and disfavoring others. We actually have a story that indicates, it acts as a sign to illustrate that actually the Buddha had perfect partiality. Now, you know that the Buddha had a cousin, Devadatta, and Devadatta was always very jealous of the Buddha, and he was always antagonizing the Buddha, or he was trying to match up, you know, so whatever the Buddha could do, Devadatta was trying to say, I can do just as well. Um, so there was this occasion where he prepared a very strong medicine and the Buddha actually could take this medicine and he would not be affected. However, Devadatta was going to be very sick if you consume the medicine, but he was in that antagonism with the Buddha and the Buddha was saying, don't take this medicine, please don't take it, you'll be very sick. He didn't listen and he took the medicine and as a result, he became very sick. He became very sick and he was agonizing, right? It was, it was, he was suffering quite a lot. Now, the Buddha also had a son. His son's name was Rahu or Rahula. And the Buddha came and saw Devadatta and he said, through um, the power of my equal compassion, may you recover from your illness. So he said, I swear that I have as much affection for you as I have for my own son, Rahula. And if this is true, from the, due to the power of this truth, may you recover. And Devadatta recovered from his illness. And that was like the oath of truth. In, the Buddha was indicating that he has exactly equal amount of uh, compassion or care for the one who was antagonizing him and for his own son. So his compassion actually extends to all sentient beings without a, excluding anyone, without any partiality. Okay, so that was the third point. The fourth point is that the Buddha always works for the uh, welfare of others, irrespective of whether they have benefited him or they have harmed him. Now, in our case, definitely we don't act in this way. We keep very clear tags of uh, who has been helpful, who has uh, been uh, unhelpful to us and we act accordingly. But the Buddha is someone who is always working for the benefit of others. It doesn't matter if these beings benefit the Buddha, harm the Buddha, go against the advice of the Buddha, he's always establishing their benefit. So these are the four reasons that establish that the Buddha is a suitable object of refuge. Himself is free from all the fears of suffering. He's a very skilled teacher in leading others to be free from suffering. He has compassion without any partiality and always works for the benefit of others. So our teacher, our own personal teacher, who teaches us what to abandon and what to practice is to be seen as um, the Buddha, sent by the Buddha. Yes. All right, so uh, having given the, the four qualities or the four reasons that establish that the Buddha jewel is a suitable object for refuge, then we also reflect that, that the Dharma jewel, which is the truth of the path and the truth of cessation, upon which that being relied in order to become a Buddha, 
that Dharma jewel must also be a suitable object of refuge. And also the Sangha jewel that are the followers who are practicing according they must also be a suitable object of refuge. So this is how we establish that the objects of refuge are suitable to be relied upon. And when we uh, understand this, we say that from today onwards until I reach the state of enlightenment, uh, I will take uh, refuge to you alone I will not go for refuge to anybody else so from the bottom of my heart I fully entrust myself to you so this is uh, the attitude of going for refuge so we have um, explained uh, the causes of going for refuge and the objects of going for refuge uh, Geshe-la decided to elaborate on the subject of refuge because it's a very important subject so remember where we are, we are in the actual practice, the actual session. In this, we have four main subjects to meditate upon. We have done reflecting on the uncertainty of death. We have done reflecting on uh, the suffering of unfortunate rebirths. And today we started training in going for refuge. As we say, there are five outlines. We covered the first two. So next week we will continue with the remaining three, which is the actual way of going for refuge, the benefits of going for refuge, and advice so training after you have gone for refuge so we stop here for tonight and we have just a few minutes for questions